Greetings, listeners. We're back once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits like the dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are lovecrafty and leaning, weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places, of cyclopean ruins, and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, this is an exploration of the Cthulhu mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. Season 8. The Picture of Dorian Gray is a gothic and philosophical novel by Oscar Wilde. First published complete in the July 1890 issue of Lippincott's Monthly Magazine. Later, it was turned into a published book form that was not censored in 1891. Enjoy The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This episode is brought to you by FoundAdamClothing.com and BunnySlippers.com. Subscribe to PGTTCM with D.B. Spitzer and Seraphie wherever you subscribe to podcasts. We use Podbean and Apple Podcasts around these parts. Check out our new website over at www.pgttcm.com. Check out the new PGTTCM merch table over at pgttcm.threadless.com. Follow on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and PGTTCM. And YouTube at People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Not much video there, but you can listen. And if you have friends who don't like to listen to podcasts, they can always just turn on YouTube and listen. <clears throat> Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Audio by everybody. Music by Kevin McLeod featuring The Chamber and Oppressive Gloom. Chapter 17 of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. A week later, Dorian Gray was sitting in the conservatory at Selby Royal, talking to the pretty Duchess of Monmouth, who, with her husband, a jaded-looking man of sixty, was amongst his guests. It was tea time, and the mellow light of the huge lace-covered lamp that stood on the table lit up the delicate china and hammered silver of the service at which the Duchess was presiding. Her white hands were moving daintily among the cups, and her full red lips were smiling at something that Dorian had whispered to her. Lord Henry was lying back in a silk-draped wicker chair looking at them. On a peach-colored divan sat Lady Narborough, pretending to listen to the Duke's description of the last Brazilian beetle that he had added to his collection. Three young men in elaborate smoking suits were handing tea cakes to some of the women. The house party consisted of twelve people, and there were more expected to arrive on the next day. "'What are you two talking about?' said Lord Henry, strolling over to the table and putting his cup down. I hope Dorian has told you about my plan for rechristening everything, Gladys. It is a delightful idea. But I don't want to be rechristened, Harry, rejoined the Duchess, looking up at him with her wonderful eyes. I am quite satisfied with my own name, and I am sure Mr. Gray should be satisfied with his. My dear Gladys, I would not alter either name for the world. They are both perfect. I was thinking chiefly of flowers. 
Yesterday, I cut an orchid from my buttonhole. It is a marvelous spotted thing, as effective as the seven deadly sins. In a thoughtless moment, I asked one of the gardeners what it was called. He told me it was a fine specimen of Robinsoniana, or something dreadful of that kind. It is a sad truth, but we have lost the faculty of giving lovely names to things. Names are everything. I never quarrel with actions. My one quarrel is with words. That is the reason I hate vulgar realism in literature. The man who would call a spade a spade should be compelled to use one. It is the only thing he is fit for. Then what should we call you, Harry? she asked. His name is Prince Paradox, said Dorian. I recognize him in a flash, exclaimed the Duchess. I won't hear of it, laughed Lord Henry, sinking into a chair. From a label there is no escape. I refuse the title. Royalties may not abdicate, fell as a warning from pretty lips. You wish me to defend my throne, then? Yes. I give the truths of tomorrow. I prefer the mistakes of today, she answered. You disarm me, Gladys, he cried, catching the willfulness of her mood. Of your shield, Harry, not of your spear. I never tilt against beauty, he said, with a wave of his hand. That is your error, Harry, believe me. You value beauty far too much. How can you say that? I admit that I think it is better to be beautiful than to be good, but, on the other hand, no one is more ready than I am to acknowledge that it is better to be good than to be ugly. Ugliness is one of the seven deadly sins, then, cried the Duchess. What becomes of your simile about the orchid? Ugliness is one of the seven deadly virtues, Gladys. You, as a good Tory, must not underrate them. Beer, the Bible, and the seven deadly virtues have made our England what she is. You don't like your country, then, she asked. I live in it. That you may censure it the better. Would you have me take the verdict of Europe on it? He inquired. What do they say of us? That Tartuffe has emigrated to England and opened a shop. Is that yours, Harry? I give it to you. I could not use it. It is too true. You need not be afraid. Our countrymen never recognize a description. They are practical. They are more cunning than practical. When they make up their ledger, they balance stupidity by wealth and vice by hypocrisy. Still, we have done great things. Great things have been thrust upon us, Gladys. We have carried their burden only as far as the stock exchange. She shook her head. I believe in the race, she cried. It represents the survival of the pushing. It has development. Decay fascinates me more. What of art, she asked. It is a malady. Love? An illusion. Religion, the fashionable substitute for belief. You are a skeptic. Never. Skepticism is the beginning of faith. But what are you? To define is to limit. Give me a clue. Threads snap. You would lose your way in the labyrinth. You bewilder me. Let us talk of someone else. Our host is a delightful topic. Years ago, he was christened Prince Charming. Ah, uh, don't remind me of that, cried Dorian Gray. Our host is rather horrid this evening, answered the Duchess, coloring. I believe he thinks that Monmouth married me on purely scientific principles, as the best specimen he could find of a modern butterfly. Well, I hope he won't stick pins into you, Duchess, laughed Dorian. Oh, my maid does that already, Mr. Gray, when she is annoyed with me. 
And what does she get annoyed with you about, Duchess? For the most trivial things, Mr. Gray, I assure you. Usually because I come in at ten minutes to nine and tell her that I must be dressed by half-past eight. How unreasonable of her. You should give her warning. I daren't, Mr. Gray. Why, she invents hats for me. You remember the one I wore at Lady Hilston's garden party? You don't, but it is nice of you to pretend that you do. Well, she made it out of nothing. All good hats are made out of nothing. Like all good reputations, Gladys, interrupted Lord Henry. Every effect that one produces gives one an enemy. To be popular, one must be a mediocrity. Not with women, said the Duchess, shaking her head, and women rule the world. I assure you, we can't bear mediocrities. We women, as someone says, love with our ears, just as you men love with your eyes, if you ever love at all. It seems to me that we never do anything else, murmured Dorian. Ah, then you never really love, Mr. Gray, answered the Duchess with mock sadness. My dear Gladys, cried Lord Henry, how can you say that? Romance lives by repetition, and repetition converts an appetite into an art. Besides, each time that one loves is the only time one has ever loved. Difference of object does not alter singleness of passion. It merely intensifies it. We can have in life but one great experience at best, and the secret of life is to reproduce that experience as often as possible. Even one who has been wounded by it, Harry, asked the Duchess after a pause. Especially when one has been wounded by it, answered Lord Henry. The Duchess turned and looked at Dorian Gray with a curious expression in her eyes. What do you say to that, Mr. Gray? she inquired. Dorian hesitated for a moment. Then he threw his head back and laughed. I always agree with Harry, Duchess. Even when he is wrong, Harry is never wrong, Duchess. And does his philosophy make you happy? I have never searched for happiness. Who wants happiness? I have searched for pleasure. And found it, Mr. Gray? Often. Too often. The Duchess sighed. I am searching for peace, she said. And if I don't go and dress, I shall have none this evening. Let me get you some orchids, Duchess, cried Dorian, starting to his feet and walking down the conservatory. You are flirting disgracefully with him, said Lord Henry to his cousin. You had better take care. He is very fascinating. If he were not, there would be no battle. Greek meets Greek, then. I am on the side of the Trojans. They fought for a woman. They were defeated. There are worse things than capture, she answered. You gallop with a loose rein. Pace gives life, was the riposte. I shall write it in my diary tonight. What? That a burnt child loves the fire. I am not even singed. My wings are untouched. You use them for everything except flight. Courage has passed from men to women. It is a new experience for us. You have a rival. Who? Oh. He laughed. Lady Narborough, he whispered. She perfectly adores him. You fill me with apprehension. The appeal to antiquity is fatal to us who are romanticists. Romanticists? You have all the methods of science. Men have educated us, but not explained you. Describe us as a sex, was her challenge. Sphinxes without secrets. She looked at him, smiling. How long Mr. Gray is, she said. Let us go and help him. I have not yet told him the color of my frock. Ah, uh, 
you must suit your frock to his flowers, Gladys. That would be a premature surrender. Romantic art begins with its climax. I must keep an opportunity for retreat. In the Parthian manner, they found safety in the desert. I could not do that. Women are not always allowed a choice, he answered. But hardly had he finished the sentence before from the far end of the conservatory came a stifled groan, followed by the dull sound of a heavy fall. Everybody started up. The Duchess stood motionless in horror, and with fear in his eyes, Lord Henry rushed through the flapping palms to find Dorian Gray lying face downwards on the tiled floor in a death-like swoon. He was carried at once into the blue drawing room and laid upon one of the sofas. After a short time, he came to himself and looked round with a dazed expression. What has happened? he asked. Oh, I remember. Am I safe here, Harry? He began to tremble. My dear Dorian, answered Lord Henry, you merely fainted. That was all. You must have overtired yourself. You had better not come down to dinner. I will take your place. No, I will come down, he said, struggling to his feet. I would rather come down. I must not be alone. He went to his room and dressed. There was a wild recklessness of gaiety in his manner as he sat at table, but now and then a thrill of terror ran through him when he remembered that, pressed against the window of the conservatory like a white handkerchief, he had seen the face of James Vane watching him. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 the next day, he did not leave the house, and indeed spent most of the time in his own room, sick with a wild terror of dying, and yet indifferent to life itself. The consciousness of being hunted, snared, tracked down, had begun to dominate him. If the tapestry did but tremble in the wind, he shook. The dead leaves that were blown against the leaded panes seemed to him like his own wasted resolutions and wild regrets. When he closed his eyes, he saw again the sailor's face peering through the mist-stained glass, and horror seemed once more to lay its hand upon his heart. But perhaps it had been only his fancy that had called vengeance out of the night and set the hideous shapes of punishment before him. Actual life was chaos, but there was something terribly logical in the imagination. It was the imagination that set remorse to dog the feet of sin. It was the imagination that made each crime bear its misshapen brood. In the common world of fact, the wicked were not punished, nor the good rewarded. Success was given to the strong, failure thrust upon the weak. That was all. Besides, had any stranger been prowling round the house, he would have been seen by the servants or the keepers. Had any footmarks been found on the flower beds, the gardeners would have reported it. Yes, it had been merely fancy. Sybil Vane's brother had not come back to kill him. He had sailed away in his ship to founder in some winter sea. From him, at any rate, he was safe. Why, the man did not know who he was, could not know who he was. The mask of youth had saved him. And yet, if it had been merely an illusion, how terrible it was to think that conscience could raise such fearful phantoms and give them visible form and make them move before one. What sort of life would his be if day and night... Shadows of his crime were to peer at him from silent corners, to mock him from secret places, to whisper in his ear as he sat at the feast, to wake him with icy fingers as he lay asleep. As the thought crept through his brain, he grew pale with terror, 
and the air seemed to him to have become suddenly colder. Ah, oh, in what a wild hour of madness he had killed his friend! How ghastly the mere memory of the scene! He saw it all again. Each hideous detail came back to him with added horror. Out of the black cave of time, terrible and swathed in scarlet, rose the image of his sin. When Lord Henry came in at six o'clock, he found him crying as one whose heart will break. It was not till the third day that he ventured to go out again. There was something in the clear, pine-scented air of that winter morning that seemed to bring him back his joyousness and his ardor for life. But it was not merely the physical conditions of environment that had caused the change. His own nature had revolted against the excess of anguish that had sought to maim and mar the perfection of its calm. With subtle and finely wrought temperaments, it is always so. Their strong passions must either bruise or bend. They either slay the man or themselves die. Shallow sorrows and shallow loves live on. The loves and sorrows that are great are destroyed by their own plenitude. Besides, he had convinced himself that he had been the victim of a terror-stricken imagination and looked back now on his fears with something of pity and not a little of contempt. After breakfast, he walked with the Duchess for an hour in the garden, and then drove across the park to join the shooting party. The crisp frost lay like salt upon the grass. The sky was an inverted cup of blue metal. A thin film of ice bordered the flat, reed-grown lake. At the corner of the pine wood, he caught sight of Sir Geoffrey Clouston, the Duchess's brother, jerking two spent cartridges out of his gun. He jumped from the cart, and having told the groom to take the mare home, made his way towards his guest through the withered bracken and rough undergrowth. "'Have you had good sport, Geoffrey? he asked. "'Not very good, Dorian. I think most of the birds have gone to the open. I dare say it will be better after lunch when we get to new ground.' Dorian strolled along by his side. The keen, aromatic air, with brown and red lights that glimmered in the wood, the hoarse cries of the beaters ringing out from time to time, and the sharp snaps of the guns that followed, fascinated him and filled him with a sense of delightful freedom. He was dominated by the carelessness of happiness, by the high indifference of joy. Suddenly, from a lumpy tussock of old grass some twenty yards in front of them, with black-tipped ears erect and long hinder limbs throwing it forward, started a hare. It bolted for a thicket of alders. Sir Geoffrey put his gun to his shoulder, but there was something in the animal's grace of movement that strangely charmed Dorian Gray, and he cried out at once, "'Don't shoot it, Geoffrey! Let it live!' "'What nonsense, Dorian!' laughed his companion, and as the hare bounded into the thicket, he fired." There were two cries heard, the cry of a hare in pain, which is dreadful, the cry of a man in agony, which is worse. "'Good heavens! I have hit a beater!' exclaimed Sir Geoffrey. "'What an ass the man was to get in front of the guns! Stop shooting there!' he called out at the top of his voice. "'A man is hurt!' The headkeeper came running up with a stick in his hand. "'Where, sir? Where is he?' he shouted. At the same time, the firing ceased along the line. Here, answered Sir Geoffrey angrily, hurrying towards the thicket. Why on earth don't you keep your men back? Spoil my shooting for the day. Dorian watched them as they plunged into the altar clump, brushing the lithe, swinging branches aside. In a few moments, they emerged, dragging a body after them into the sunlight. He turned away in horror. It seems to him that misfortune followed wherever he went. He heard Sir Geoffrey ask if the man was really dead, and the affirmative answer of a keeper. The wood seems to him to have become suddenly alive with faces. There was the trampling of myriad feet and a low buzz of voices. 
A great copper-breasted pheasant came beating through the boughs overhead. After a few moments that were to him in his perturbed state like endless hours of pain, he felt a hand laid on his shoulder. He started and looked round. Dorian, said Lord Henry, I had better tell them that the shooting is stopped for today. It would not look well to go on. I wish it were stopped forever, Harry, he answered bitterly. The whole thing is hideous and, and cruel. Is the man... He could not finish the sentence. I am afraid so, rejoined Lord Henry. He got the whole charge of shot in his chest. He must have died almost instantaneously. Come, let us go home. They walked side by side in the direction of the avenue for nearly fifty yards without speaking. Then Dorian looked at Lord Henry and said, with a heavy sigh, It is a bad omen, Harry, a very bad omen. What is? asked Lord Henry. Oh, this accident, I suppose. My dear fellow, it can't be helped. It was the man's own fault. Why did he get in front of the guns? Besides, it is nothing to us. It is rather awkward for Geoffrey, of course. It does not do to pepper Peters. It makes people think that one is a wild shot. And Geoffrey is not. He shoots very straight. But there is no use talking about the matter. Dorian shook his head. It is a bad omen, Harry. I feel as if something horrible were going to happen to some of us. To myself, perhaps, he added, passing his hand over his eyes with a gesture of pain. The elder man laughed. <laughs> the only horrible thing in the world is ennui, Dorian. That is the one sin for which there is no forgiveness. But we are not likely to suffer from it. Unless these fellows keep chattering about this thing at dinner, I must tell them that the subject is to be tabooed. As for omens, there is no such thing as an omen. Destiny does not send us heralds. She is too wise or too cruel for that. Besides, what on earth could happen to you, Dorian? You have everything in the world that a man can want. There is no one who would not be delighted to change places with you. There is no one with whom I would not change places, Harry. Don't laugh like that. I am telling you the truth. The wretched peasant who has just died is better off than I am. I have no terror of death. It is the coming of death that terrifies me. Its monstrous wings seem to wheel in the leaden air around me. Good heavens, don't you see a man moving behind the trees, there, watching me, waiting for me? Lord Henry looked in the direction in which the trembling gloved hand was pointing. Yes, he said, smiling, I see the gardener waiting for you. I suppose he wants to ask you what flowers you wish to have on the table tonight. How absurdly nervous you are, my dear fellow. You must come and see my doctor when we get back to town. Dorian heaved a sigh of relief as he saw the gardener approaching. The man touched his hat, glanced for a moment at Lord Henry in a hesitating manner, and then produced a letter which he handed to his master. Her grace told me to wait for an answer, he murmured. Dorian put the letter into his pocket. Tell her grace that I am coming in, he said coldly. The man turned round and went rapidly in the direction of the house. How fond women are of doing dangerous things, laughed Lord Henry. It is one of the qualities in them that I admire most. A woman will flirt with anybody in the world as long as other people are looking on. How fond you are of saying dangerous things, Harry. In the present instance you are quite astray. I like the Duchess very much. But I don't love her. And the Duchess loves you very much. But she likes you less. 
So you are excellently matched. You are talking scandal, Harry, and there is never any basis for scandal. The basis of every scandal is an immoral certainty, said Lord Henry, lighting a cigarette. You would sacrifice anybody, Harry, for the sake of an epigram. The world goes to the altar of its own accord, was the answer. I wish I could, love, said Dorian Gray, with a deep note of pathos in his voice. But I seem to have lost the passion and forgotten the desire. I am too much concentrated on myself. My own personality has become a burden to me. I want to escape, to go away, to forget. It was silly of me to come down here at all. I think I shall send a wire to Harvey to have the yacht got ready. On a yacht, one is safe. Safe from what, Dorian? You are in some trouble. Why not tell me what it is? You know I would help you. I can't tell you, Harry, he answered sadly. And I dare say it is only a fancy of mine. The unfortunate accident has upset me. I have a horrible presentiment that something of the kind may happen to me. What nonsense! I hope it is, but I can't help feeling it. Ah, here is the Duchess, looking like Artemis in a tailor-made gown. You see, we have come back, Duchess. I have heard all about it, Mr. Gray, she answered. Poor Geoffrey is terribly upset. And it seems that you asked him not to shoot the hare. How curious. Yes, it was very curious. I don't know what made me say it. Some whim, I suppose. It looked the loveliest of little live things. But I am sorry they told you about the man. It is a hideous subject. It is an annoying subject, broke in Lord Henry. It has no psychological value at all. Now, if Geoffrey had done the thing on purpose, how interesting he would be. I should like to know someone who had committed a real murder. How horrid of you, Harry. How horrid of you, Harry, cried the Duchess. Isn't it, Mr. Gray? Harry, Mr. Gray is ill again. He is going to faint. Dorian drew himself up with an effort and smiled. It is nothing, Duchess, he murmured. My nerves are dreadfully out of order. That is all. I am afraid I walked too far this morning. I didn't hear what Harry said. Was it very bad? You must tell me some other time. I think I must go and lie down. You will excuse me, won't you? They had reached the great flight of steps that led from the conservatory onto the terrace. As the glass door closed behind Dorian, Lord Henry turned and looked at the Duchess with his slumberous eyes. Are you very much in love with him? he asked. She did not answer for some time, but stood gazing at the landscape. I wish I knew, she said at last. He shook his head. Knowledge would be fatal. It is the uncertainty that charms one. A mist makes things wonderful. One may lose one's way. Always end at the same point, my dear Gladys. What is that? Disillusion. It was my debut in life, she sighed. It came to you crowned. I am tired of strawberry leaves. They become you. Only in public. You would miss them, said Lord Henry. I will not part with a petal. Monmouth has ears. Old age is dull of hearing. Has he never been jealous? I wish he had been. He glanced about as if in search of something. What are you looking for? she inquired. The button from your foil, he answered. You have dropped it. She laughed. I still have the mask. It makes your eyes lovelier, 
was his reply. She laughed again. Her teeth showed like white seeds in a scarlet fruit. Upstairs in his own room, Dorian Gray was lying on a sofa with terror in every tingling fiber of his body. Life had suddenly become too hideous a burden for him to bear. The dreadful death of the unlucky beater, shot in the thicket like a wild animal, had seemed to him to prefigure death for himself also. He had nearly swooned at what Lord Henry had said in a chance mood of cynical jesting. At five o'clock he rang his bell for his servants and gave him orders to pack his things for the night express to town and to have the brougham at the door by 8.30. He was determined not to sleep another night at Selby Royal. It was an ill-omened place. Death walked there in the sunlight. The grass of the forest had been spotted with blood. Then he wrote a note to Lord Henry, telling him that he was going up to town to consult his doctor and asking him to entertain his guests in his absence. As he was putting it into the envelope, a knock came to the door, and his valet informed him that the head keeper wished to see him. He frowned and bit his lip. "'Send him in,' he muttered, after some moments' hesitation. As soon as the man entered, Dorian pulled his checkbook out of a drawer and spread it out before him. "'I suppose you have come about the unfortunate accident of this morning, Thornton?' he said, taking up a pen. "'Yes, sir,' answered the gamekeeper. "'Was the poor fellow married? Had he any people dependent on him?' said Dorian, looking bored. "'If so, I should not like them to be left in want, and will send them any sum of money you may think necessary.' "'We don't know who he is, sir. That is what I took the liberty of coming to you about.' "'Don't know who he is?' said Dorian listlessly. What do you mean? Wasn't he one of your men? No, sir. Never saw him before. Seems like a sailor, sir. The pen dropped from Dorian Gray's hand, and he felt as if his heart had suddenly stopped beating. A sailor? he cried out. Did you say a sailor? Yes, sir. He looks as if he had been a sort of sailor, tattooed on both arms and that kind of thing. Was there anything found on him? said Dorian, leaping forward and looking at the man with startled eyes. Anything that would tell his name? Some money, sir. Not much. And a six-shooter. There was no name of any kind. A decent-looking man, sir, but rough-like. A sort of sailor, we think. Dorian started to his feet. A terrible hope fluttered past him. He clutched at it madly. Where is the body? he exclaimed. Quick, I must see it at once. It is in an empty stable in the home farm, sir. The folk don't like to have that sort of thing in their houses. They say a corpse brings bad luck. The home farm. Go there at once and meet me. Tell one of the grooms to bring my horse round. No, never mind. I'll go to the stables myself. It will save time. In less than a quarter of an hour, Dorian Gray was galloping down the long avenue as hard as he could go. The trees seemed to sweep past him in spectral procession and wild shadows to fling themselves across his path. Once, the mare swerved at the white gatepost and nearly threw him. He lashed her across the neck with his crop. She cleft the dusky air like an arrow. The stones flew from her hoofs. At last he reached the home farm. Two men were loitering in the yard. He leaped from the saddle and threw the reins to one of them. In the farthest stable a light was glimmering. Something seemed to tell him that the body was there, and he hurried to the door and put his hand upon the latch. There he paused for a moment, feeling that he was on the brink of a discovery that would either make or mar his life. Then he thrust the door open and entered. On a heap of sacking in the far corner was lying the dead body of a man dressed in a coarse shirt and a pair of blue trousers. A spotted handkerchief had been placed over the face, 
A coarse candle stuck in a bottle sputtered beside it. Dorian Gray shuddered. He felt that his could not be the hand to take the handkerchief away and called out to one of the farm servants to come to him. Take that thing off the face. I wish to see it, he said, clutching at the doorpost for support. When the farm servant had done so, he stepped forward. A cry of joy broke from his lips. The man who had been shot in the thicket was James Vane. He stood there for some minutes looking at the dead body. As he rode home, his eyes were full of tears, for he knew he was safe. End of chapter 18